Hi everybody, my name is Nikki Moreno and I'm one of the TAs that works for the GEP. Uh, today I will be helping you use the small Exxon Finder and I'm going to tell you all about how to use it, when to use it, and why we use it. In your project, if you find yourself having to annotate a gene on a contig, that means you're going to have to map the gene onto a target species using specific coordinates. That is typically done hand in hand with glass and depending on what information you want will also dictate which glass program you're going to use. I think analogies are a great way to explain a certain process, especially when it's a bit unclear as to why you're doing something. In this case, when you are using uh, the search engine blast, it's a lot like taking a full page and trying to find an identical page within a whole bookcase. Now with a whole page, you could probably throw some pictures on it, or there might be a lot of text. So it's very easy to find a page that is identical to the one that you're using in the search. So let's think maybe you weren't given a whole page to look through this database. Let's say you were given a couple words, some letters. Uh, in the case of gene annotating, what if your exon you're trying to find is only three amino acids long? Using GLASS might give you too many hits, and several of those hits may have high E values. So the solution to this problem is using the small exon finder, so that way it limits the amount of places you have to look on that actual database. Usually, your internal coding exons are going to span a larger genomic region than your terminal coding exons, but sometimes that's not always the case. Looking at the example for the gene SEMA, we can see that there are many uh, smaller internal coding exons. So this is a perfect example of when you would use the small exon finder. One might ask themselves, why not just use BLAST and narrow the search subrange? This is something you could do, but small exon finder is a very powerful tool that uses phasing and canonical or non-canonical donor and acceptor sites in order to pinpoint which matches are vital or not. Whereas BLAST only gives information on similarity of search, likelihood of encountering the same sequence, and the open reading frame. You can use BLAST and small exon finder together by using one of them to locate the potential area that you want to look at, and then using the other tool to verify the actual location of your small exon. As I was mentioning before, uh, there are advantages to using the small exon finder, but there are also disadvantages, such as when you populate results from the small exon finder, you might have a result that has the correct number of amino acids and correct phasing, but it has the incorrect amino acid sequence. Or maybe it has a similar amino acid sequence and correct phasing, but there's an incorrect number of amino acids. When you run into these problems, you're able to actually use RNA-seq and prediction tracks to your advantage, and that information can help you consider whether or not you found the CDS in question. So before we start with our example, uh, before you can start finding exons, you gotta find the small exon finder. And pretty much every single project is going to use it as long as you're trying to annotate genes and you run into the problem of a small CDS. But today's example is going to be used with the Pathways project. So I'm going to click Pathways and that'll take us to a lovely Pathways page where we have all of these resources and tools. And at the bottom, we see the small exon finder. So I'm gonna click that. And I'm brought to a screen where I can change my coding exon type. I can identify a start and end position. I can identify the strands, CDS size, and with the coding exon type, this bottom part of the small exon finder is going to change. So with an initial exon, we get donor site, donor phase. With an internal exon, we get donor site, acceptor phase, donor phase. And with a terminal exon, we get an acceptor phase. So all three of those will change depending on 
what CDS you're trying to find. So now that we've talked a little bit about the Small Exon Finder, or SEF for short, we can go ahead and introduce what our example is going to be, which will be the gene called UNC13 in CONFIG12 of Drosophila mohavensis. By the time you've decided to use the Small Exon Finder, you should have already gained a lot of information about your gene using the uh, Gene Record Finder. But for the sake of this example, we're going to go ahead and do that together. So uh, go back to the Pathways page, and when you're there, there's going to be Gene Record Finder as a resource. And you're going to type in UNC13, and here we go. What makes this gene really good, as far as an example, is if you scroll down and you check out the first CDS 1 underscore 2126 underscore 0, we see that the first CDS is actually only two amino acids long. If you try to do the search in BLAST, you'll get a result that says that there was no sequence similarity found, which is another good indicator in this case by the fact that this is only two amino acids long and you're getting that as a pop-up that you want to use the small exon finder to figure out where the CDS is. As I mentioned before, if you are annotating a gene, you should have already collected information on that gene and by using BLAST you would have already located where that gene is in your target species. But for the sake of this example, we can just go to the GEP UCSC Genome Browser Gateway, uh, click on D. Mohavensis, which is down here, and we're going to change the assembly to September 2008 GEP dot and type in UNC13. And we know it's in config 12. And here we are, exactly where we need to be. So what we saw earlier was that uh, isoform PG used that first CDS. And if we zoom in here, we can tell that some of our prediction tracks are predicting a very small exon in this area. And we also see that the top hat junctions shows that there should be some type of intronic region here that would have connected this CDS to the first CDS. So now is a good time to start gathering the information you need in order to use the small exon finder. As I mentioned before, the prediction tracks and the top hat junctions also give way to the idea that the first CDS is going to be in that section. We can also use RNA-seq to our advantage to see that, yes, it's probably going to be in this area as well. So the next thing we need to do is set up boundaries for our search area. And I'm going to intuitively pick the beginning of the adjacent gene and the beginning of where it looks like the second exon starts for UNC13. Before I can actually establish the left-handed side for our start position, I need to know the phasing for the acceptor site for exon 2, so I know what the donor site phasing should be for exon 1. And we know that UNC13 is on the bottom strand, so we're going to go ahead and flip those bases. And when I look into this area, I know that uh, the exon starts at 21,915. Now, a previous BLAST search showed that this exon was on open reading frame minus one. So if I zoom in closer, I can see that the phasing for this exon is actually phase zero, which means the donor site for exon one has to be phase zero as well. We're going to go ahead and use 21,915 as the start position. And we know that the strand is minus. The CDS size is going to be 2. 
we are going to go ahead and leave the donor site alone and let the donor phase be zero. Now all we have to do is find an end position for our search. So looking for an end position, we're just going to zoom out and find the adjacent gene. Your end position also does not have to be exactly where that adjacent gene is. Um, if you have enough confidence and evidence to show that it could be prior to the adjacent gene, then go ahead and use that. Uh, I'm just going to use the number 23,720. So we have that there, and the last thing I need to do is just to upload my sequence file, which is console 12, and I have that in a text document, and now I'm ready to find my results. Okay. And what do you know? We actually have one that is empty, just as we were hoping to find. So let's go ahead and see if these coordinates agree with what the browser says. So I'm going to enter in console 12, paste that in, and add my hyphen. And let's see what happens. And look, it actually put us exactly where the RNA-seq and the predictions track lined up for that little area. When trying to use the small exon finder, it's always good practice to confirm these locations with BLAST or to just use BLAST in general to your advantage so that way you can be more confident in what your answer is. But that pretty much brings this example to a close. Thank you so much for joining me today and have a wonderful time annotating genes.